I want to thank you for, for being here. As I said earlier, I've been praying for you and praying for this day. This day is a big day. And there are certain days that are always going to be remembered because of the days that came after them. Days that were frankly game changers. Some of these unforgettable days were not expected until they dawn. We didn't see them coming. My, my sweet friend, Miss Margaret, who's now with Jesus, who went to be with him a number of years ago, but she told me about hearing of the news when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And she knew everything's going to change. My wife and I. Uh, just a week ago, we were blessed to visit Arlington National Cemetery and go to see the grave site of President John Fitzgerald Kennedy. And when he was assassinated, uh, I wasn't alive yet. But it sent shockwaves through our nation. And things changed in the days that followed that. My children are going to tell their grandchildren where they were on 9-11. Because some days just change the days that follow. And sometimes those game-changing days were expected. In fact, we look forward to them with great anticipation. There was, there was great anticipation for D-Day. Many people knew at some point, they didn't know exactly when, but at some point, the Allies were going to cross the English Channel and they were going to take the fight into Europe to win the war. Many believe that the day that Barack Obama was inaugurated as our president was significant. We live in a country where a man with dark skin was once considered property. And now he was considered president. I'm not getting into whether you voted for him or not. But that was a game-changing day. Maybe for you, it was anticipating your wedding day. Maybe it was the birth of a new child. We have a brand new grandbaby. And we, we are uh, kind of liking this. <laughs> do, do you remember the excitement that you felt as a child the night before Christmas? The children of God cannot contain the excitement they have the night before Easter. For the Christian, faith is not built on platitudes and principles. It is built, it is grounded on three historical days that were game changers. Days that would shape the way that we live and interpret the rest of all of our days. Paul reminds us of those three days when he reminds the church in Corinth of his gospel. This is what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received, and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you believed in vain. For what I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. And we believe those three days changed everybody's days. So walk with me through those three days. It began on Friday. And we believe Friday sowed the seeds for evil's destruction. Because Paul says, on Friday, Christ died for our sins. And if that's true, it changes everything. Because sin is the problem. In 564 B.C., in the Olympic Games, in Greece, there was a competition that combined boxing and wrestling, kind of like our modern MMA. And a man named Erigion of Galia was the two-time reigning champion. 
And during the final match, his opponent was able to get him in a stranglehold with his legs around his body on the ground. And he was leaning back with all of his might. And it was about to end Arikion's life when Arikion grabbed his foot that was around his waist and twisted it with all of his might and dislocated his ankle. And he let go, his opponent let go of that stranglehold he had on him because he was in pain and he quickly threw up his hand to resign the match saying he had lost. Well, Arikion got up, stood up and fell right down, face down in the dirt and he died. Well, the judges, shortly after, they, they looked at the sequence of events and they declared Arikion is the true winner of this match because of what he was doing to win the match. And it was the only time in Olympic history that a man won while dying. But it would happen again. Because on the cross... Jesus did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. You see, I want you to understand something. Before Jesus could be your Savior, He had to be a victor. He had to win a battle. He had to deal with the bondage that the curse that was created by sin holds over us. And so what we believe happened on Friday, as Paul says, Christ died for our sins. He made the payment. He dealt with the debt. He broke the curse. And we don't have to live captive to the tyranny of sin over our lives anymore. Maybe today you struggle, struggle with a particular sin, an and addiction, an attitude, something that just has a grip on you, a hold over your life. It's, it's in bondage for you. And we believe that because of what Christ did, because the Spirit now lives in His church, that He can have us step out of that bondage. And into freedom through Him. That we can break free from that tyranny over our lives. We don't have to live in bondage to sin anymore. We don't have to live in this fear of dying. The Hebrew writer says in Hebrews chapter 2, Because God's children are human beings made of flesh and blood, the Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could He die, and only by dying could He break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could He set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of the dying. What the Bible is saying is that on Friday, a victory was won. That Jesus overthrew the devil's illegitimate sovereignty. That the seeds of the destruction of evil were laid that day. Now granted, the devil has not been eliminated yet. But we have been liberated. His bluff has been called. His illegitimate sovereignty has been exposed. We don't have to live in bondage to that anymore. The Bible says in Colossians 2, He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So we believe on Friday, a victory was won that will culminate in the total and final removal of evil from the people of God forever. And we believe that that happened on Friday because we remember Sunday. And Sunday shows us a glimpse of what's coming for us. You see, Sunday was God's validation of Friday. It was God's seal of approval of Jesus' finished work. Because 
Wouldn't you agree that coming back from the dead is the ultimate game changer? I don't know where you are with God. Whether you are a follower of Jesus or whether you're just checking out Jesus or whether somebody just drug you here to church or they bribed you to come to church or you don't really care about Jesus a whole lot, but you've got to agree, if Jesus did come back from the dead, that is a game changer. That's the claim. That Jesus Christ came back from the dead. So there really are only two responses to this. Either praise God or no way. But whatever, that's not a response. That's not an option. Because resurrection demands a total reevaluation. There's this brilliant line in Tolkien's book, Lord, The Lord of the Rings, where Sam Gamgee, the hobbit, realizes that Gandalf, his mentor, whom he thought was dead, is in fact alive. And he says to Gandalf, we thought you were dead. And then there's this genius line. Is everything sad going to come untrue? And if Jesus came back from the dead, then yes, everything's sad. Is going to come untrue. And our confidence in the future isn't baseless. It is grounded in the past and in what Jesus did. That's why we believe what he will do, because we believe that everything that happened to Jesus is going to happen to us. Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. You see, Easter doesn't just announce that Jesus came back. That, that was Sunday's promise. But it also gives us the promise that Jesus is coming back. Sunday points to the great day to which every single day is actually headed. And so Peter could say in 1 Peter 1, Through Christ you believe in God who raised Christ from the dead and gave him glory. So your faith and your hope are in God. On the Christian calendar, there is a sense in which the future has already begun to invade the present. And if you have eyes of faith, you can already see this new future is dawning. But it is also true that we have not yet received our full inheritance. He came back from the dead. But the reality is, we live in Saturday. And we still get biopsies. And we still take chemo treatments. Parents will pick up their kids from school and drive them to the house where the other parent lives. Good people still have trouble finding jobs. We still need ambulance drivers and casket makers because it's still the night before our Easter. Martin Luther King told a great story that took place during the famous Montgomery bus boycott that launched the Civil Rights Movement. Her name was Sister Pollard. She was 70 years old. She was an African-American woman that believed in this cause of Martin Luther King. And so like others in the city, she agreed to stop riding the buses that were unjust in their treatment of African-American people. Well, that's one thing to ignore public transit if you're a 22-year-old young person. It is another thing if you are a 70-year-old woman that has no other way to get around town. And she did not. So she walked, and she did so to support the cause. And sometimes she walked only a few blocks. Other times she had to walk many miles. And one time as she walked, the car pulled up beside her to offer her a ride. And because of her belief in the movement, she declined it. And the driver said, aren't you tired? And Martin Luther King said that Sister Pollard replied, my feet is tired. But my soul is at rest. And I love that. Because my feet is tired. In fact, all of me is tired. Because 
I live in Saturday. And I want to live in Saturday well because it is the night before Easter. And I, I want to live the rest of my days without being fearful, without being anxious, and most certainly without whining. I want to live the rest of my days with a rested soul. And here's why I can. Look at what Peter says in 1 Peter 1. All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we have been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. We who live in Saturday know something. You see, Saturday knows that what's coming trumps what's happening. And so the reason we do not live full of despair is because we don't believe that the tomb is full. We believe the tomb is empty. And so we live every day in view of the day because of what happened that first game-changing Easter Sunday. Look at how that same verse is rendered from the message. Because Jesus was raised from the dead, we've been given a brand new life and have everything to live for, including a future in heaven, and the future starts now. Let me tell you what's hard about Saturday. It's not the presence of evil. It is the absence of hope. You cannot survive Saturday without hope. Because hope reinterprets everything. Maybe you heard the story about four widows playing cards in the lobby of their nursing home. An older, distinguished gentleman comes in and he waits up by the front desk. And one of these four widows says to him, what are you doing here? And he said, well, I'm checking in. I'm going to start living here. And the second widow says, well, where are you from? And he says, well, to be honest, the last 20 years I've been in prison. The third widow says, well, how come? He says, well, if I can be candid, it's because I murdered my wife. And the fourth widow says, so you're single. <laughs> <laughs> because hope reinterprets everything. You see, what happened that first Easter Sunday does not erase all the pain that we experience on Saturday. But it does give us leverage over it. Evil has its moments, but evil does not have the last word. What Jesus did on Friday and Sunday means that our trials on Saturday don't last. But our trial will live forever. Now, this does not mean that you need to put on a fake, plastic face and act like Saturday is always easy. Jesus does not expect that because Jesus gets Saturday. He understands Saturday. As a matter of fact, he's been there and done that. But what his victory does ask is that we interpret Saturday through the lens of Friday and Sunday. <coughs> But for you and me, it is still the night before our Easter. So we groan, but we don't cry. Because it's the night before Easter. So Paul says in Romans 8, verses 22 through 23, We know that everything God made has been waiting until now in pain. Like a woman ready to give birth. Not only the world, but we also have been waiting with pain inside us. We have the Spirit as the first part of God's promise. So we are waiting for God to finish making us His own children, which means our bodies will be free. Our Easter is real, but it has not yet been fully realized. Some of you this morning are in a very good place. Life is good right now. Life's really working for you right now. And that's a praise God. And I'm telling you to enjoy that because it's probably not going to last. But some of you, 
are dealing with some very hard things right now. Some wounds and some sorrows that run very deep. And you are exactly where you need to be at church hearing the gospel of hope as you interpret your own burdens. That's the key. Not to fake, pretend, but to cope with hope. Believe the gospel. Let Friday and Sunday interpret Saturday. I love people who live with hope. Hope is not optimism. Hope is something better. Optimism depends on people. Hope depends on God. Optimism is positive thinking. Hope is passionate <coughs> trust. Optimism says it's not so bad. Hope says sometimes it's really bad. But God is so much better. And so what we do on Saturday is we, we manifest faith and we let hope interpret the dead. No father or mother holds their child and thinks, you know, one day I'm going to bury this kid. But you and I know that that can and it does happen. It is probably the worst thing that can be endured on planet Earth by any human being. I heard about a couple who had lost their daughter. She was actually grown and a mother of her own. She's 31 years old, mother of two children. She got sick with what they thought was the flu, but in a couple of days she had to be hospitalized, and that began an 18 journey that ended with this couple named Rick and Beverly watching their precious daughter die from a blood infection. As they were leaving the hospital after their daughter had passed, Beverly grabbed her husband's arm. And she said with tears streaming down her cheeks, tell me again what we believe. And he grabbed her hands and he looked her in the eyes. And with his voice shaking, he said these words, the tomb is empty. Because it is the night before Easter. And what happened on Friday and Sunday means that we are going to live in Saturday with hope inside of us. Someday, our Easter will come, and our bodies will rise. But we don't wait for that day for our faith to rise, for our hope to rise, for our hands to rise, for our voices to rise. Because it is the night before Easter, and we know what the future holds. So I want you to stand up with me. And we're going to sing. The praise team is going to come forward and we're going to sing a song that, that declares and interprets all that we believe. So let me pray over you. <coughs> Heavenly Father, thank you for the game-changing day of Easter Sunday. Thank you for dying for our sins on Friday. Thank you for the silence of Saturday and the knowledge that Sunday is coming. In Jesus' name.